enhanced into the treatment areas. <clears throat> so today, you know, basically the study area is the the largest where on record currently is the largest historical uh, fire in Arizona history. It started in, on May 29th. Uh, uh, May uh, 29, 2011, from a bandit campfire, uh, and it basically burned over about 29 days, maybe 30, 32 days. Uh, it's located on the Packers Graves National Forest. You can see here, I hope you can see my mouse down here. So uh, a, a portion of the fire, well, probably 90% of the fire burned on in Arizona, but it also overlapped into New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, the study area where we are looking at is in mixed conifer, high elevation forest. So, uh, average elevation is about 6,000 uh, feet, or you know, 2,900 meters. And a lot of the treatments prior, a lot of the treatments that were implemented prior to the fire, was started from the White Mountain Stewardship Field Treatments Initiative. And before the fire in 2011, uh, they had they had basically then uh, about 14,000 acres. And they you know, targeted these acres around uh, uh, several of the major uh, Wui communities. And you can see we have two of the communities that we, that we focus on, Nutriosis and Alpine. But they also had some field treatments around Greer and Eager. But uh, we looked exclusively at Nutriosis and Alpine because uh, as, as I get Farther into the presentation, you would see the fire progression map uh, in terms of you know how the fire hit these communities because we were we were trying to avoid uh, looking at communities where there was fire suppression or defensive action, mainly burnouts and and retardant drops. So in the areas that we look at, uh, it the fire burned within the first seven days, and when it hit the like Alpine, it it, was, it, it it had burned about four days, and they did not have have uh, a chance to do burnout operations. So uh, I mentioned we looked at Alpine and Neutrosis. Uh, they they initially started their thinning treatments of their, uh, in Alpine. So Alpine Unit 2 and Unit 6. So in Alpine Unit 2 and Unit 6, the, the initial prescriptions were basically they went in and they thin from below to kind of like an even, so even age management. So the spacing between the trees, uh, they had a, 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 description, a prescription based on uh, descriptions. So they say we want to thin to 15 by 15. Uh-oh. What is this? Wait, hold on one second. I, I have a block, I have a screen here. So one moment. Why is this? <laughs> so Janine, this I have a screen in front of me that would not move. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Almost. Do you have some um, a video? Well, it's it's the opening screen that's in the in in the I can't see the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Why don't you give me control? Okay. Seem to be hung up a little bit here. Sorry, folks. Hold on. So the the thinning treatments were basically the first one in Alpine two and Alpine six was even age, even age spacing by drip line, like I mentioned. And then uh, those prescriptions they weren't favored by most of the locals, so they decided to uh, change the prescription to uh, to include. All, not only trying to reduce crown fire hazard, but also to enhance you know wildlife habitat. 
So in those areas, they they left a few of what a few of the latter fuels. So they, they they moved away from the plantation like uh, thinning treatments. Then in in in, in all of the uh, treatment areas, uh, it was a, a a whole tree harvest. So they thin from below to the target uh, 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 spacing, and they removed the trees and they, they processed them in a landing. And the plan was on paper to go back into these units and do a, a broadcast burn to reduce the surface fuel. Uh, but the wildfire fire came before that actually happened. So uh, most of our, well, all of our areas that we looked at, it was a thinning from below to a target TB, TPA, uh, uh, but they did not have the opportunity to do a, a surface field treatment. Let's see here if I can remember the rest of the slides. Yeah. So, Morris, is it that the slides aren't advancing? Well, I, I can't. Yeah, they're not advancing. I cannot see it because this opening Adobe Connect screen is, is in the way. So I, I can see it advancing oh. in the back, but I, I actually wait. Okay, so so let, let's see. I, I think I can do it this way. I can't see it, but I, I can see a, a portion of it so I know what's there. Okay. Okay. Oh, can can you uh, advance? Okay, okay. So so here yeah. if it's advancing, it doesn't look like it's advancing. Uh this is an image of Alpine two before the thinning treatments, and this is just from Morris. Yes, I, I'm sorry. It, um, I'm not saying that advance. Um, is there a way you can um, can you, you you can't minimize the Adobe screen? Or can you give me control? Yeah, I, I'm 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 clicking accept. And it's just advancing okay. the, the slides I can see in the background now. Okay, I'm not seeing them advance. I don't know if others are seeing them advance or not. Oh, they're not, not advancing because I have two computers up. I see. Well, um, hmm. Okay, just hold on one second. Let's see. You want to? How about can can you close out your PowerPoint and then relaunch it? Yeah, let's let, let's. Sorry, folks. We're we're experiencing some obviously some difficulties here. Um, so we've asked um, Morris to re-enter, and so he should he should be back here very shortly. Um, fire uh, post wildfire conditions. This is the same image I showed you earlier that basically shows the fire come up over the hill and then burn down into the thinning treatment areas. This is Alpine 6 uh, looking from uh, uh, the road. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to uh, install line transects across the treatment boundaries in the direction of the fire spread. And so the, the, the study design is similar to what Hugh Stafford did on the Lake Tahoe Basin and 
uh, a couple other researchers have used the same approach uh, in terms of looking at how the fire uh, progressed from the treated area, and I mean from the un from the untreated area into the burn area. So, and we we had three three planting areas. So Alpine two, Alpine six, and Neutrosis. And we installed all together about 274 plots. Uh, and in each each planting unit, we, we had, you know, and we had different number of uh, line transits. So in each plot, uh, which was 30 meters apart, we installed three plots in the untreated area. And then we, uh, from the treatment boundary down into the treated area, the plots range from anywhere between 10 and 25. And we measured all trees uh, in each plot, uh, uh, you know, everything from uh, zero inch all the way up until, you know, I think it was like 35. Okay, so what about right now? Yeah, you, you I let me know if I. It. Okay, let's see. Let's see where I need to go. Okay, so this is where we left off like ten minutes ago. So here are the thinning treatments uh, uh, in Alpine two and Alpine six. They did this uh, plantation type thinning treatments with you know uh, thinning to a drip line, and then they trans they they converted the treatments from the plantation to more of a clump. Because they wanted to reduce crown fire hazard and also maintain wildlife habitat, so this was in neutrosis. They also did a whole tree harvesting, where they uh, the the intent was to do come back after they had completed the treatments. They were going to do a prescribed fire. Uh, the prescribed fire never happened in these units before the fire made it there. So all of our units are whole tree harvest without a surface field treatment. So here is an image, a Google image of the Alpine unit six prior to thinning treatment. And you can see the continuous vegetation all the way from the, the summit of the mountain all the way down into the community. And the community right now is, you know, is grayed out because it's a, this is a bad Google Earth image. Uh, after the thinning treatment, you can see uh, right where we have the starting location. That is the treatment boundary. Uh, so they thin from the community all the way up to the treatment boundary. Here's a here's a post image of uh, post thinning treatment after Alpine two. This is the pre treatment of neutrosis be, uh, before the thinning treatment, and then this is post. So here is a, a fire progression map for the Wallow fire. So you can see uh, Alpine units, uh, Alpine planting area, and the neutrosis planting area. And also on the right hand side, it shows the fire progression map for the first eight days of the fire. Or the first eight days of the fire. And we were really looking at uh, June 3rd and June 6th when the fire descended into the Alpine community and the neutrosis community. So this is a post treatment. Uh, of Alpine 6, you can see most of uh, severe crown fire in the upper part, and then you can see as the fire entered the treatment, there was uh, uh, variable fire effects. So what we wanted to do is to, to, to measure what was the change in fire behavior or uh, as the fire descended from the untreated into the treated area. And so the, the design that we selected is uh, similar to what Hugh Stafford has done and the Lake Tahoe based on, on the, in, in 2006, I think. And so we installed linear transects from the treatment boundary, uh, from the burned and untreated through the treatment boundary into the burned and treated. And we installed three plots in the untreated, and then the, the number of plots varied 
from the treatment bound all the way to the end of the treated area. We measured all trees, uh, regardless of height or DBH. So here's a, a schematic of you know how we went from the burned and untreated into the treated area. And here's an overview of all of the planting areas that we installed the plot. We installed about uh, three transects in Alpine 2, uh, uh, seven in Alpine 6, and about six in, in, into neutrosis. So on each plot, we, we uh, installed three brown transects to collect down with the fuels. And then we collected a, a DBH height, height to live crown, height to uh, crown based on all trees. We also measured minimum min and max bowl char, uh, max crown scorch height, percent crown scorch. And then we also had this uh, uh, measure of burn severity. So on a scale of one to five, where one was no uh, burn, and then five was basically everything was consumed. The only thing was remaining was the skeletons of the trees. So for each plot, we used FDS, FFE to basically quantify the forest structure. And we also use FDS to basically to calculate, you know, what would, what, what would have been the predicted fire behavior if we were just to use the model only. So we downloaded the 97 percentile weather from the local raw station, so Alpine uh, raw station. And then we also contacted the meteorologist to get to obtain uh, the mobile weather uh, unit operations report. So about I don't know, 30 reports where we looked at the predicted fire behavior for the day and the observed fire behavior for the day. We also spoke with the AFMO, the FMO, and a couple of fire behavior analysts to talk about you know when the fire came into town and what actually happened because we wanted to avoid inventory stands where there was suppression action. And so, you know, the one hour, 10 hour fuels, those are the fuels that we ran the fire behavior under. And uh, we also, we simulated the, the wildfire under 30 mile per hour wind speed. Uh, it sounds high, but actually on most of the days when the fire came into town, they had a uh, mobile rod station that recorded wind gusts up to 40 miles per hour. So basic statistics, uh, we ran exploratory data analysis to test the difference in severity and stand structure between the, the, the treated and untreated, and also to look at the difference uh, among the treatment units. So we did ANOVA and, and Tukey's HSD were appropriate. And then the spatial analysis part is what Maureen did in terms of looking at uh, plot uh, fire severity from as a dis as relation distance into the treatment area. So what we're what I will basically present is mostly uh, prelim result. So here's an image from the road also looking up into Alpine uh, Unit 6. And you can see uh, this band of, of, of from, from black, uh, brown, into green. And in the, in, the, in the burn area, you can also see that there's lots of uh, uh, green vegetation. And most of that is from rehab immediately after the fire where they went in and they planted wheat and straw to basically stabilize the slopes. So here's an image of what it looks like in the burned and untreated. And then as you progress down from the treatment boundary, you can see that the fire effects change. So mostly, this is mostly for the civil culture. So, you know, pre-treatment, you can see the damage of distribution. You have lots of ladder fuels, so what I would consider ladder fuels from 2 inches up to like 10 inches. And then you, as you uh, progress and look at the treated area, you know, most of those ladder fuels were, remo were removed. So uh, comparing the fuel bed characteristics between the uh, treated and untreated, uh, everything was significant uh, except the quadratic mean diameter. So the bulk density, canopy base height, tree density, all of those were significantly different between the treated and untreated. I won't discuss the difference, uh, the significance between uh, among the plots because there were some uh, significance and there was some some things that were not significant. Uh, post fire surface fuels for all plots. Uh, there was no uh, difference between the one hour fuels between the, the the treated and untreated. But we did see some significant differences between the 10-hour and the 100-hour fields. Uh, 
using FDS modeling, uh, obviously uh, the results follow what we actually measured. You can see that there are significant differences between the torsion index and the Kralin index between the treated and untreated. And then uh, if we project the fire, if we project each plot to see what FDS would have predicted for the fire types, you can see uh, the first three rows is basically the controls, and then they have the number of plots. And you can see most of the plots would have been, the FDS projected them as active or conditional crown fire. So in neutrosis, all of the control plots were active. And then as you move into the treated area, you know, one thing that surprised us was you, you would think that a lot of these areas would be projected as, you know, at least surface fire. But what, what, what we actually saw was that in FDS, a lot of the uh, plots were projected as passive crown fire, which, which, which kind of makes sense because of the, the, uh, the different thinning treatments that they implemented. Uh, trying to uh, maintain wildlife habitat. If we look at the burn severity, where you know one is unburned and and four and five is severely burned, if you look at the control, uh, what I ended up doing was I summed the the burn severity index from you know light to severe, and you can see in the control you have uh, a large percentage of the trees uh, that has uh, moderate and severe uh, uh, burn severity. And then if you get down into the treated area, you know, a lot of the, uh, the trees or the, the, the number of trees actually were unburned and scorched. So it kind of follows what we, what we thought. Uh, crown scorch, there was a significant difference between the treated and untreated for all units. And so Alpine 2, Alpine 6. And there was also uh, differences between the plots, which we don't display here. So quick summary, uh, you know, we presented quantitative evidence that thinning treatments reduced fire severity by looking at crown scorch. And, you know, some of our conclusions are thinning treatments, you know, they, it, you know, they were effective at changing fire behavior and most importantly, changing those uh, parameters that actually uh, affect uh, crown fire initiation. Uh, treatment units differ in uh, in forest structure both in and outside the treated area. And some of the things that we're discussing is, you know, really, you know, how large of a, uh, how large should treated areas actually be? Uh, when I was talking to some of the, the, the fire folks, they said, well, you know, if we would have, you know, made some of our treatment areas bigger, then we could have, you know, basically prevented the fire from coming into a lot of these communities. So that's the, the conclusion what, of what I would present, and then next it would be Maureen. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Maureen. Thanks for allowing us to tag team this today. And so what I'm going to talk about is the spatial analysis of the fire, change in fire severity as the fire moved from the untreated area into the treated area. And so just to recall, here's that picture coming and looking down the ridge in the direction of fire spread in Alpine 6. Yes, where it says yes. Um, and you can see the transition from black to, to brown to green along the direction of fire spread. And you can pretty clearly see where that treatment edge is as you transition from the black to the brown. And so we laid the transects down. And then we have three plots in the untreated area. And the reason why we only had three plots in the untreated area is that there was such low variability. They, those trees were pretty much nuked in the entry area. There really wasn't a return on investment to measure anything further. And then we just ran the plots into the treated area until basically you encountered homes. <clears throat> and so we can, all the plots were about 30 meters apart. And so you can look at the distance along the transect, or you can look at the distance relative to the treatment edge. So you can see that, for example, if you, if you set the treatment edge at zero, the first plot in the treated area would be given a distance of 30 meters from the treatment edge. But then the first plot in the untreated area, we would just go negative. So if you set the treatment edge at zero in the untreated area, 
in the untreated area, you have a negative 30 meters, so the first plot would then be negative 90 meters from the treatment edge. And so what we want to do is look at the, sorry, let me go back here, for each plot, measure the percent crown scorch, and then look at the change in percent crown scorch with the distance from the treatment edge. And so that's what these next plots are going to look like. And so we're looking at all conifer trees greater than 10 meters in height. And the way, the relationship that we found in the, as the fire transitioned from the untreated area into the treated area was highly nonlinear. And for the people who are mathematically inclined, we used a Weibull function, which you see here on the top right. And the parameter of interest in that Weibull function is that parameter K1. And what that represents is the distance into the treated area at which fire severity goes below a certain threshold. And we use that then to quantify the distance into the treated area at which the fire severity was reduced from that active ground fire into more of a surface fire or passive ground fire behavior. So here are three plots of the percent crown scorch against distance from treatment edge. You can see here are all of the trees and all of the plots in A2 in the untreated area. This side would be the untreated area. Here's the treatment edge and here's the treatment area. The size of the points relates to the number of trees. And so, for example, in the untreated area, all of the trees were at or near 100% crown scorch. And so you have upwards of 100, 150 trees at 100% crown scorch. And then you get increased variability as you move into the untreated the treated area. And so you can see that we drop down from most of the trees having 100% crown scorch to some variability until most of the trees have 0% crown scorch. The red vertical line here is that estimate of K1, which gives you, in essence, the inflection point of this curve where you start transitioning once again from that high severity to low severity. And so you can see Here's the most extreme example of Nutrioso, where almost all of the trees buried deep in the treatment edge actually exhibited 100% crown scorch. Then you have this extreme threshold pattern where the distance in the treatment edge where that transition occurred was somewhere right around 500 meters. For A6, it was near closer to 250 meters. And for A2, it was somewhere around 150 meters. So we fit these for each of the severity metrics, and we're going to show you crown scorch and bull char height, and you see a very similar pattern of that nonlinear threshold relationship as you cross that treatment edge. Once again, this is untreated and this is treated, but you can see that bull char height actually was reduced much closer to the treatment edge than was the crown scorch. And we can see that a little bit more clearly in the next slide, that the units clearly differed in those distances. So once again, we're looking at where this curve hits that inflection point, moving from high to low severity. And that's what each of these points represents. So A2, crown scorch exhibited lower severity around 150 meters, whereas A6 exhibited lower severity around 250. And Nutrioso took more than half a kilometer to exhibit that reduction in crown scorch. If you look at Bolchar Heights, it, in A2, it was reduced right at the treatment edge almost immediately. As soon as it hit that treatment edge, the thing dropped down to the ground. In A6, it took around 100 meters. And in NU, it reached around 350. And so we can see that these distances that we're estimating can differ by which severity metric that you're actually measuring, which might be a different indicator of fire severity or fire behavior as the fire was moving from the untreated area into the treated area, and there's clear differences among the units. And so what we're showing is that there's a strong edge effect, and in particular, we're talking about the contagion of the high-intensity fire, and so that particularly exhibited in that percent crown scorch. And what we think is happening is that the fire was so hot, there was so much convective radiative heat transfer, that even if the fire itself, maybe flame heights were relatively low as it moved into the treated area, it was still burning so hot that it managed to scorch the crowns themselves. And that's, once again, especially seen in Nutrioso. But the fire was reduced to surface conditions within the treatment boundaries. Remember that Nutrioso, the treatment, had a much wider buffer. So even though it took longer into the treated area, it was further into the treated area where the fire severity was reduced, it was still reduced within the treatment boundary, and it was still successful 
in protecting the homes and providing that defensible space for the homes from this high intensity fire. Once again, that distance did differ among the units and it did differ by the severity metric. And in particular, these distances did vary from less than 100 meters or very, very close to the treatment edge to more than half a kilometer. And something else that we want to consider is that we estimate these distances, but these distances are the distances at which the severity was reduced. And so you need additional space between where the severity is reduced and where the homes are located in order to have that space where you have that low fire behavior over a certain distance where you provide that defensible space. And so we actually require a larger buffer than those implied by these estimated distances in order to provide that defensible space. And one of the interesting things about this case is that the fire was spreading downhill. And presumably some of the fire behavior was already being reduced simply by the fact that it was spreading downhill as it entered the treated area. And so for example, if you want to try to apply this to other locations, if the community is located uphill from the direction of fire spread, you would expect your buffers, for example, to be wider. And something else that we're considering is we're wondering whether some of the differences among the units that we see in terms of that distance into the treated area, if it's related to perhaps a different intensity or different heat of the fire outside of the treatment, as it went into Nutrioso, was it actually more severe than when it entered into A2, for example? And that's something that we're still sort of um, Thinking back and forth in discussion and trying to decide if that's one of the factors influencing these different results. And so just a quick, um, we're just about done here, some take home messages at the end of the day is that we do see that the field treatment works. Even when if you, as they modified the prescription for Nutrioso, including clumps of trees, which might have had a predicted higher fire severity, which we did see the Nutrioso treatment, it still worked. It still protected the um, residences in that community. But what we're learning is that if you are allowing for that kind of allocation of wildlife cover, for example, as in the Nutrioso, where you're not doing the even, evenly spaced stand, you do need a larger buffer. You need a larger area treated to give time for the fire to slow down, for it to reduce in intensity before it reaches the community. <laughs> we're also finding that the landscape context of the fire is important. And so you need to take expected fire severity outside the treated area into account. And as you saw, there's an abrupt transition in the vegetation from the untreated area to the treated area, where the untreated area had this homogenous, very densely packed fuels that were very dry that created this intense extreme fire that persisted into the treated area, even though the fuels were very much reduced in the treated area. And so we need to take that into account. If the fire severity had been expected to be lower outside the treated area, then maybe we can make some more allowances within the treated area in terms of size or wildlife cover. And so if resources allow, we would think maybe to take steps to reduce the fire severity outside of the immediate wooey buffer. And what we might classify that as some sort of speed bumps to the fire spread. I'm not sure what happened here. Increased buffer. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened with this guy. Increased buffer to allow for defensible space once severity is reduced. Right, so once again, the buffer itself that we are estimating, these distances that we're estimating is the distance where severity is reduced. You need to allow for a little bit additional buffer for that defensible space before the fire actually reaches the home so that you can protect the homes effectively. And now I think we're ready for questions. And um, here are some acknowledgments from all the people who have helped us with this research. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we do have some questions. And I, I remind folks, if you type a question in the chat box, and then make sure to click on the little, um, um, boy, you know, the little sign right next to it so that it gets posted. Um, Morris and Maureen, can you see the chat box? Yes. Okay, so Scott Brogan has a question there, and um, can you address that? He wonders what the target trees per acre were in the treatment when thinning from below. Well, it was a, 
a spacing. I, 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 it was a spacing to 15 by 15 spacing between drip lines. So that was the target in Alpine 2 and Alpine 6. I, I might have said Trees Breaker because I converted the mobile to Trees Breaker. So it was a spacing 15 by 15 space, uh, 15 by 15 based on drip line. Okay. And he also asks that, that he couldn't see what you were doing. That course would he to agree to on the chart. What, what was the question? He asked, he says that he couldn't see what you reduced your CBD to on the chart. Or, I'm sorry, canopy bulk density. Well, uh, so, can you, can you see it now? Yeah, so, I'm it, not it, sure. so in, in, in uh, Alpine 2, it was it roughly. Small. So, Alpine 2, 0.25 down to 0 0.05 so the everything was basically reduced below 0 0.05 kilograms per meter cube, meter cube and before treatment it was a 0.15 and above okay we've got some more folks typing ah here's another question from guest three can you read that oh uh, let's see So, um, are, can you address that question? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to read it. I had to go to another computer. So the, the okay. So the first thing is, uh, none of the of the treated areas received a surface field treatment. It was a whole tree harvest only. Yeah, and and so because of that, what and what we're discussing is really. Before the fire, okay. So, so after they did the thinning treatment, they did the whole tree harvest. But we, we don't have any estimate of what was the loading before the fire. And so what we see is that uh, there was no significant difference between in the one hour fuels between the treated and untreated. But there was significant difference with the larger fuels, so the ten hour and a hundred hour. So we we think well, I'm I'm quite sure the fire, you know, changed or you know probably reduce some of the one hour fuel. But we don't have an estimate of what was there before. We don't know if the differences between among the units between the treated and untreated actual direct fire effects. Higher okay, you, uh, fire Maureen, you'll have to get closer to the... Sorry, I'm Maureen, just um, adding what Morris... So I'll just add into what Morris just said, that we don't know if differences we see in these fuels between the treated and untreated has to do with direct fire effects. So maybe some of the one hour fuels were, con were, were lower in the treated area, but in the untreated area, the fire was so, so severe, all the fuels were consumed, for example. Um, and so we just have no way of separating the effects of the treatment from the effects of the fire on these fuel loadings. Okay, there's more typing going on. I will read the questions to you if I can um, decipher the some of the short shortcuts and shorthand. It, we don't see the question. Right, I know. Which is yeah, okay. It's okay. We, we, we're going to work out the kinks next time. <laughs> Um, guest three asks, were there part of the fuel treatments that were not burned over to estimate pre-burn surface fuel load? I wish. No, it was, you know, the, no, the answer is no. We, there, the, there were reports that uh, post-thinning treatment surface fuel loadings were recorded, but I, I was unable to track down that data. 
and it it, it it was really some plots that they that they randomly put into the the treated areas. I mean, in the treated areas, and they really ran this one brown transact, so it was kind of a quick survey. But in terms of being in the in the same uh, location uh, as the fire, there was there, there was no area that we could have used to uh, as a surrogate of uh, pretreatment. Are we there? And then another question, were there pre-burned photos of fuel treatments that one could use in photo series? Uh, no, I, I was unable to get any uh, photo points uh, before the, uh, the wildfire. Uh, no, no, the answer is no. That's the quick version. Okay. okay. <laughs> other questions? Have a few more minutes. Um, there are other questions being typed. Uh, Morris, if you want to give me control, I think then you can see the questions as they come up in the chat room if um, you can view my screen. Maybe not. Pro probably not. Um, okay, another, another question. I heard you say that you sampled areas that didn't have suppression action taken. What can you say about similar areas where suppression was done? So in areas where they did, where they did do suppression, you know, the field treatments. Okay, first we did not we did not uh, visit those visit those areas in terms of looking at uh, putting in plots, but from what the the firefighters. And, uh, and the suppression forces say that the, those areas that received treatments, they were effective, but it was a, a effective in a different way. It, it allowed them the opportunity to get in and basically do, do burnout. There was also a couple areas in the Greer where uh, most of the residents did, did not like the, the intensity of the thinning treatment, and so they left a lot more trees. And so the firefighters were not able to basically do su uh, suppression action. Are we seeing that? Okay, perfect. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so I heard. Okay. Likely. Yes. So, you know, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I, we think if there was a prescribed fire, then. Maybe the fire would not have progressed as far into the, the treated area, uh, assuming that there was an increase in surface fuels after. But yeah, I, I think if we had had a chance to complete the, the thinning treatment cycle, that you would have probably had less crown scorch because you, you remember, as the fire uh, progressed from the burn and untreated as a crown fire, it transitioned from a crown fire to basically surface and passive. And from what the managers and some of the firefighters uh, said that, you know, the fire, it burned on the ground all the way into town. So it carried as a surface fire. So that tells me that there was probably a lot of uh, surface fields on the ground because these are not very productive sites where we were. Any other questions for our speakers? Someone else is typing. Well, if you think of any other questions, you can email me or you just you can Google. I think there are some. Specific. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yes, this like will be said. available online, and actually, here's it. We'll have it on the Northwest Fire Science Consortium website. There's the web address. Um, it'll probably take a couple days, or uh, maybe by tomorrow um, or Monday. Certainly, it, it'll be up. It depends on how fast they can get it to me, and um, so it will be there um, as 
you know, with all of its, all of our technical glory. <laughs> oh boy. So, I, I know. I think we have another. There's some more, and maybe possibly another question coming up, and then, um, and then we'll um, we'll go ahead and let everybody go to lunch. <laughs> um, got another. <laughs> But and while we're waiting, I would really like to thank um, Morris and Maureen very much for this. Um, I apologize again for all of the technical things that happened. Um, these are certainly things that sometimes will creep up, and I think that there's a possibly demonic intrusion on that, and on that's the story, and I'm I'm sticking to it. So. Um, We'll just give another minute here to see these questions come up. Oh, guest three asks, are fuel treatments designed to facilitate fire suppression action actions like sprinkler systems, fire retardant drops, or fire line construction? Morris? Yeah, it, it, it depends on what the management objective was. And so in, in this case, they wanted to uh, reduce crown fire hazard. And Obviously, by reducing crown fire hazard, it would give them the opportunity to come in to uh, do fire suppression action. Because if you think about it, if you if you go back to the the slide where I showed pretreatment, if there was a, a fire in in that fuel condition, you know, the the fire would have probably burned through the town without the fuel treatment, because it yeah it, it was pretty severe in the burning and untreated. So yeah, so I, I guess the, the question is, I guess the answer is is yes. So yes, field treatments, well, they use them as a, a, a surrogate for fire suppression. So yes. So, okay. Okay. Any other questions? I think. Well, thank you very much, Morris and Maureen. Again, thank you very much. Um, this was really interesting, and it will be available online. Um, at that website that I've put in the chat room. So folks, um, remember that we'll have another uh, webinar coming up on um, June 6th. And I will be with a, a ready mail who will, will be our guest speaker. And I'll be sending out some um, notifications on that um, with web address and and all that kind of stuff. And so I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much.